Good morning. Good morning and happy Easter. What a glorious day this is and what a great time to be celebrating Christ's resurrection in our world today. I pray that God's blessing is just upon you, wherever you are watching from this morning. Um, Whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're going through, whatever you're celebrating, whatever you're grieving, I pray that this day that God will just roll away whatever stone is blocking your life and that this new life and this new transformation may just become a part of your life this day. If we were all in person, I would uh, begin today by saying, Christ is risen, and invite you to say, Christ is risen indeed. And even though we're virtual, I think it's still something that we can do. So I invite you just to join me from home. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. If you're watching this live on Sunday morning, I'd like to invite you to join us up at the church in a little bit at 10.30 a.m. We're going to be having our outdoor portion of the service. We'll be singing a couple of songs and sharing communion together and having a blessing out by our garden. And so I'd love for you to join us in that, in that time, that place to continue the, this celebration. If you're watching this later in the week or if you can't make it up or whatever's going on, we just pray that the resurrection will be a part of your life as well. Now let us enter into this time and space of worship and let's begin that with our call to worship. Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it is true. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We hear a voice call our name, and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen. Christ is risen is risen indeed. Thanks be to God.
Our scripture reading today comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they may go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Holy and loving God, we come to you on this day of resurrection, celebrating an end to our time of wilderness. We come to you celebrating new life and new possibility. We celebrate that you are risen yet again. And we come that praying that we might be risen with you as well. God, all of the experiences of that first Easter morning, the fear as they walk to the tomb, the questions about how will we roll the stone away, the sense of just worry and concern about what they might find when they reach the tomb, the confusion at finding it empty, the celebration that Christ who had died is now risen again and the fear about all that that might mean. God, this whole range of emotions that these women first experienced, God, we still experience them today. God, we look to all the great things that are happening in our lives and in our communities and in our world. God, we see everything coming to life. We see winter ending. We see flowers coming in bloom. God, we see people again. We see gatherings that are starting to happen. We see maybe the first glimmerings of an end to this year of pandemic. God, we look to all of these possibilities and we celebrate with them. But God, we still contain all of these other feelings as well. Fear as to what the future might look like. Concern about the wounds and divisions that still exist within our society and within our own lives. And God, just the questions about how can we roll this stone away? How can we cross this obstacle? How can we keep going when we don't seem to have the strength left? God, we bring all of that to this day, and so we bring all of that to you. That your blessing, that your spirit, that you just simply might move in us to transform us and to give us new life.
So we come together this Easter morning. This is now the second Easter that we've celebrated in this way with um, a virtual service and uh, an empty sanctuary and people watching from their homes and things like that. Um, I remember last Easter, we were just beginning this pandemic and imagining, you know, first trying to still understand what was going on and imagining that, you know, this may just last a few weeks and then maybe just a few months. And, you know, who knew that a year from now <laughs> we, we'd still be in this situation. Um, and as we start to see some glimmers of hope and glimmers of transformation as, you know, vaccines start to go out and all of that, um, we also have that, you know, kind of feeling of frustration that we're so close to the finish line and yet we're not quite there yet and still wrestling with some of those realities. I think all of that is especially important um, on this Easter Sunday, this day that we set aside to celebrate resurrection, to tell this uh, most powerful of stories of women and disciples going to a tomb and expecting to find everything that they had lost and instead finding that the, the tomb was empty, <laughs> that what they feared was not there, and instead something much more powerful, much more hopeful, much more transformative than they imagined had just occurred. It's a story that's much like our situation where transformation is happening and yet we don't quite know what to do with it yet. Today we read this version of the Easter story that comes from the Gospel of Mark. And often we read it from one of the other Gospels, you know, especially from the Gospel of John, which tells a lot more detail. 
it goes into a lot more of the story and it tells the story of the women first visiting the tomb but it also talks about the disciples running to visit it later and tells stories of what happens after the fact and adds much more kind of elaboration on this day and what happened whereas in mark's gospel and in mark's version we just get the short and sweet tale and Mark's version is also interesting because in many ways, these verses are the end of, of the story. Uh, Mark's gospel doesn't go on to tell of, you know, the appearances that Jesus did after the resurrection, of when he appeared to, to, you know, doubting Thomas, when he appeared to Peter to offer him forgiveness. It doesn't tell anything that happened after that. Mark was the first gospel that was written um, and in some ways, it, it ends with this verse, you know, as what we read, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's it. They left and, you know, they heard this powerful tale that Jesus was risen, but they left and it says they were afraid and they didn't know what to do with it. Of course, in many Bibles, you'll see that Mark has some more verses written in them, but a, a lot of times, you know, it, it will occur, like, it will have some of these lines, like, in mine, it says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. And so in a lot of the earliest texts that we have, what we imagine to be the, the earliest gospel of Mark, that was the end of the story, that was it. And you can imagine a lot of people reading it and thinking what we think today of, that's it? They left and they were afraid? Like, that's a really kind of a downer for an ending. What happened next? We want a happy ending. We want a happily ever after. And you can see how someone, you know, in later times would have gone back and added on to this to the story to tell more of what happens next and we see this in the other gospels and that's not saying that what happened next isn't true but just that at first mark didn't even write it and i think we've all had this experience of you know you like you watch a tv show and you get really invested in it and you follow it week after week and season after season and you're waiting for that epic finale to tie everything together and then it just doesn't quite happen and sometimes after that, it's hard to go back and rewatch it. You know, I've had several shows like that. I think of the old show Lost, where, you know, I was really invested in figuring out everything that happened. And then the end, it was like, oh, that's, that's okay. <laughs> um, and I never, never kind of watched it again. We all want a really good ending. And in some ways, Mark's gospel doesn't provide that. And probably that's why we don't often read this version on Easter morning. But I think what is important here, and what's really powerful that Mark expresses, is that sometimes resurrection is a complicated thing. And sometimes resurrection and the power that it brings just doesn't happen in the way that we expect. What happens in this telling of the gospel is you see this whole range of emotion through the lens of these three women who went to the tomb on that first Easter morning. It talks about how they, you know, got up early and went to the tomb that day carrying spices so that they may go to Jesus' body and anoint it. You can imagine what that must be, to go to a tomb expecting to find Jesus' body and carrying the spices to anoint it. They were walking to that tomb that day expecting Jesus still to be dead. They had just witnessed Jesus' death in the most gruesome of ways just a couple of days before this. And in many ways, they were probably still processing that thinking about what it means thinking about this person who had so changed their lives and now he's not with them anymore you can imagine the grief and the loss that they were processing as they walked to the tomb the tears that must have been shed on that walk as they got up early that morning and it says, as they were walking, they asked to each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? 
I know I do this a lot when, you know, I'm processing emotions that are very hard to understand, when I'm processing things that are, you know, kind of really big and hard to express. Sometimes we focus on the very concrete. We focus on logistics. You know, it's like when we're grieving, we, we start cleaning the house because it's something practical. It's something to do. It's something to focus on. It's something that we can accomplish. You know, it's hard to understand our emotions, but we know we can get a broom and sweep up a room and like we can see the difference from dirty to clean and we can know that we've done something and it's something to pour ourselves into and it's something to focus on and it's something simple to take our mind off what we can't understand. And so the women that same day, you know, they're, they're grieving, they're dealing with Jesus' loss, they're wondering what that means, they're wondering what they're going to do in the future, they're wondering where this is all going to go, they're wondering how they're going to resume their lives now that Jesus isn't there, and they're focusing on the practical, well, what are we going to do about that stone? How do we actually accomplish this? They're focusing on the details. And then it says, when they got there, they hear good news. They see, the first of all, that their concerns didn't have, you know, weren't warranted, that the stone was rolled away. And they see a young man, it says, dressed in white. And he says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, but he is risen. And he then almost goes to qualify it, like, I know you, you probably don't believe me, but look here in the tomb. His body isn't here. It's empty. I have proof, this young man seems to say. Here's the evidence, if you don't believe me. This angel, we presume, goes out of his way to do everything he can to reassure these women that this is a good thing. Don't be alarmed. Don't be worried. A wonderful thing has happened this day. Let me tell you the good news. And yet, how do these women respond in the moment? Trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Don't be alarmed the angel says. There's no reason to fear. Christ is risen. But that doesn't stop them from being afraid, from being worried, from wondering what this all means. They come to the tomb that day in grief and sorrow and confusion and asking questions. They hear this most wonderful of news And they leave not quite knowing how to process it. Later, we'll know that there is more to the story, that there's times when they finally are able to process this news, when the good news gets out, when the disciples start preaching, when people are baptized. We know that this story has a positive ending, but right here, right now, as Mark's gospel ends, Christ is risen. The good news is here, but we don't know what to do with it yet. I actually kind of love that we have Mark's gospel, which ends here. I love that we have multiple gospels. You know, sometimes it can drive us crazy in this day and age because we want to know, well, what's the truth? You know, what's the true story? How did it all happen? And it bugs us that sometimes the gospels don't line up with each other and Luke's gospel tells it this way and Matthew's gospel tells us this way and which one's the real one? And, you know, we get all confused about that. But it's, in a way, it's wonderful that we have these different perspectives because it shows us how different people processed and understood what the resurrection is. And we know this to be true today. Not everyone receives this good news in the same way. And the good news is universal. It's for everybody, but it works in each of us a little bit differently. And having multiple Gospels and multiple stories allows all of us and all of our differences to find our place in the story, to find a way that we can identify with it. And I, in a way, love that Mark's Gospel ends here. 
because it's not necessarily the happy ending that we want. But sometimes that's what resurrection is. It's not just a, and everything was happily ever after. It's not just a ride into the sunset. Sometimes resurrection is complicated. And often when it happens, we're still processing what it means. And the resolution that we want doesn't come quite as soon as we expect. We had kind of a big event in, in our life just this past week. Um, on Tuesday, um, my wife and I, we, we actually closed on a house. It was the first time we, we had bought a house. It was the first time we had kind of gone through all of that. And we had seen it multiple times, you know, when we you know, first went to, to make an offer. And when we were looking at houses, we came back for the inspection and, you know, all of that. I learned how complicated that whole, whole process is. But we were excited this week when we finally closed because we were finally going to take our, our kids over to see the house for the first time. And we had gone and we'd closed during the day and so we were ready with our keys to you know, pick our kids up from school and we loaded them all in the car and we took them to the house and we were just so excited to show them. We're like, you can look at the rooms and see which one you want to be your bedroom. And you can go in the backyard and there was a play set that, that was already kind of built there that we were excited to show them and for them to play on. And we were so excited for them to see it that we just couldn't wait. And so we drove into the house and we you know, opened up the garage and we're like, kids, we can't wait to show this to you. And we opened the door and then we're like, what do you think? And they looked around and Jonah, our oldest, was like, it's empty. He looked and he was like, there's no furniture. Where's our bed? Where's our couch? Where's our TV? You know, the most important thing to, to a six-year-old. Where's my TV and where is my Nintendo? You know, if those aren't here, like nothing else can be good. And we were so excited about it, but he was like, I want my stuff to be here. And of course, we were able to go and explain to him this, you know, thing called moving. And, you know, when you move, you have to get movers and you have to put things in a truck and it's a big pain and a big hassle and, you know, all of that. But, you know, that will happen, but, you know, we're not quite there yet. And he was like, oh, okay. And once he kind of settled in, he had a great time and the kids ran into the backyard and played on the play set and all was well. But there was just that moment of initial shock and disappointment of my stuff isn't here. I remember experiencing that for myself a, a number of years ago. Um, I had just graduated from seminary and my wife had finished up seminary and we were moving from Kansas City to San Francisco, California, where I was about to begin my doctoral program. And it was really exciting because it was kind of the first time we'd really like completely moved across the country and it was a brand new place and it was an exciting place to be. And we saw, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge and all of that. And we're like, how did we get to live here? And it's beautiful and the weather's nice. And, you know, everything was wonderful and we were excited about you know, starting my program and all of that. And, you know, there was a lot of just kind of adventure and adrenaline kind of going into the midst of that. There was also some of the worry and some of the concern that we hadn't quite lined up jobs yet. And so, you know, we were like, well, I don't know how we're going to pay for this really, really expensive apartment. But, you know, that'll kind of work itself out. So there was some of that kind of lingering. But we had that same moment of we walked into our new apartment and it was completely empty because the truck hadn't come yet, and we were like, well, now what do we do? And we ended up that night just going to the grocery store and grabbing a frozen pizza um, because, you know, we didn't have any pots or pans or utensils to cook, and we threw it in the oven and we ate it on the floor <laughs> um, of our tiny little apartment that we had just moved into because we didn't have anything else. And it wasn't the most romantic thing in the world. <laughs> you know, it wasn't glamorous just sitting on this carpet, but it kind of worked. We were so excited about where we were, but we weren't quite there yet. 
I think we often have these experiences in our lives. Certainly we don't move all the time or move into new houses all the time or things like that, but we have moments of change where we have these big expectations and we're, where we have big dreams and big hopes about what things could be, and then it just doesn't quite happen the way we think. We find that we're kind of caught in the in-between. In Christianity, we talk a lot about resurrection. We talk a lot about new life. We talk a lot about salvation. We talk a lot about transformation. We talk a lot about the hope and the possibility that this story can bring. That by following Jesus, by the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we can move from death to life. We can move from the problems and just the mistakes of our past and instead see the new possibilities that God can open up for us. We talk about the transformation that God can bring and the transformation that we can bring in the lives of others as we are Christ's hands and feet in the world. You know, Christianity is all about this narrative of moving from one place to another we once were lost and now we're found right that's the, the the narrative that we're caught up in and i want to say that that's true you know i can look in my life and see the the transformations that have happened the things that i've learned you know i look back at my teenage self and the things that i did and i'm like oh man i don't know who that guy was <laughs> or like what he was thinking right um, you know, we had this time where I like, found like some old like teenage journals of like me and my wife like back at home, and we were like, who wrote this? <laughs> like, what were we thinking? You know, when we have those moments when we can look back in our past, we're like, I am so glad I am not there anymore. We can see the ways that we've grown, the ways that we've learned, the ways that we've changed. But I don't know about you, especially looking back in my faith journey, it's hard to find a moment where everything changed. It's hard to find a specific day or a specific time where it's like, well, before then I was lost, but after then everything was great. Nothing ever is quite that black and white, is it? And as much as we like to say that Jesus makes our lives radically different, it doesn't quite happen the way that we expect. It doesn't happen all at once, right? When we're baptized, a dove doesn't fly out of the pond and, you know, God doesn't come down in a booming voice and say, this is my son whom I love. You know, I, I've known people that have had those kind of moments, but that's never been true for me. And sometimes when we don't have that kind of radical transformation, we start to wonder, did this really take? Is this really real? Am I really saved or is there more that I need to do? And when we're caught up in those moments, I love that we can look to the story in Mark and realize that that's just sometimes how resurrection happens. That like resurrection happened on that very first Easter morning, Christ was risen the good news was here before anyone could realize it and before anyone understood it. God was bringing life to people even when they were afraid of what that life might be. Good news was being proclaimed to people who did not understand what they were hearing. And the very first time an angel told someone, Christ is risen, their response was to run out the door. Imagine if you had that on an Easter Sunday where we you know, stood up in the morning and were like, Christ is risen, and everyone ran out the door. You'd be like wondering, well, what did I do? Like, <laughs> what, what happened? But that's how it happened this very first time. And I think that's an invitation for each of us, that if we feel like our resurrection is still in process, that if we feel like we're still, you know, kind of a work in progress, that, you know, there's still like, God still has some work to do on me. I'm not quite there yet. 
Well, then you have a story that's saying, well, you're in good company. Because really, when we get down to it, that's how resurrection works. That's how it happened, even to the first disciples. Sometimes we're all kind of a work in progress. Sometimes Easter is a work in progress. And that's perfectly okay. I think there's some power in recognizing that we don't need to be further along than we are. That it doesn't need to be perfect for it to be transformative. That everything doesn't need to change in order for the hope of the gospel to be real. That possibility is with us no matter what. I want to close today with a poem. This comes from one of my favorite writers, Jan Richardson, who's actually a Methodist, I believe, that does kind of some spiritual reflections and things like that. But she wrote this poem called How the Light Comes. And I think this is very expressive of kind of these Easter's in progress, <laughs> kind of this sense of resurrection as a process rather than just an event. She writes, I cannot tell you how the light comes. What I know is that it is more ancient than imagining, that it travels across an astounding expanse to reach us, that it loves searching out what is hidden, what is lost, what is forgotten, or in peril or in pain, that it has a fondness for the body, for finding its way towards flesh, for tracing the edges of form, for shining forth through the eye, the hand, and the heart. I cannot tell you how the light comes, but that it does, that it will, that it works its way into the deepest dark that enfolds you, though it may seem long ages in coming or arrive in a shape you did not foresee. And so may we this day turn ourselves toward it. May we lift our faces to let it find us. May we bend our bodies to follow the arc that it makes. May we open and open more and open still to the blessed light that comes. May we open ourselves this day to resurrection, knowing that we're still going to be working on it for a while. We may not understand it. We may not comprehend it. We may not feel it. But God is still there. Life is still possible. And hope is is still just around the corner. May you be blessed this Easter. Amen.
I pray that you will go forth and have a blessed Easter. Easter is not just a day, but instead it's a season. And so if resurrection doesn't happen for you today, if you still feel like you're a work in progress, if you still feel like you have a ways to go, that's okay. God's Spirit, may it continue to be with you in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, in the coming years. God is at work and may we be at work in the world to carry God's spirit into the places of darkness. May you go forth this day. May you celebrate this day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.